eerie castles and jagged mountains make Romania the perfect setting for vampire tales. But look beneath the winding trails and crumbling fortresses, and you'll find the story of the real Dracula. It's creepy. <sighs> From prisons where his victims would await their deaths. I don't think I would want to spend a day of my life in prison by Vlad the Impaler. To the cell in which Vlad himself was held hostage and passed the time by impaling mice. Mm, dark and dank, baby. And even the bat caves where the legend was born. Look at them, they're all over the place. Romania's underground is filled with secrets of its past. We're peeling back the layers of time on cities of the underworld, Dracula's underground. Romania is the largest country in southeastern Europe. It's a country with a long and bloody past. I'm Don Wildman. I'm in Romania, home of Dracula, both the legendary vampire and the real-life ruler. But where does fact meet fiction? The clues are buried beneath the imposing castles, medieval villages, and mysterious hillsides of Wallachia and Transylvania. We're headed for a subterranean world where fact is far more terrifying than fiction. Today we know the name from the vampire monster in Bram Stoker's Dracula, but in real life, Vlad Dracula was a 15th century prince. At only 17 years old, Dracula took the throne and went on to become one of the most notorious rulers in history. Few realize that although he was actually in power for only seven years, he managed to unite the province of Wallachia for the first time in centuries. And how did he do it? By using the most brutal and barbaric punishment ever seen, which in turn earned him the new name, Vlad the Impaler. Today, much of his legacy and the kingdom he helped to build have been destroyed. But clues that reveal who he was and evidence of his reign of terror still remain. Buried beneath the ground. Just 215 miles from the capital city of Bucharest lies a massive bat cave. It's among the largest in Romania, and it's where the legend of Dracula begins. The cave is from that way, it's not far away. You have to go huh? five minutes. Spelunker Vadim Bondar knows these caves like the back of his hand. He was taking me down into this cave system that's home to several species of bats. It's a world which has never been fully explored. It's hard to believe, but in all, there are 12,500 caves beneath this Romanian landscape. The cave we were heading into is part of a 15-mile network that descends more than 300 feet below the surface. Okay, Don, now we prepare to come in. Yeah. Okay, this is our suite. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Do you have comfortable here? All right. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Okay, this is the gate. Reservation here. The lamp, please. Down into this cave. It's really kind of spooky. Shh. What is it? Oh, wow. Look at the thumb. Oh, yeah, yeah. The thumb of the bed. Oh, there they are. Look at the bed. Look at them. They're all over the place. All of them. How cool. Vadim believes there's more than 10,000 bats living in here. They hibernate in the winter, and in the summer, they leave the caves to feed. These bats only come out under the cover of darkness, and while on the prowl, they actually eat the equivalent of their body weight in insects every day. This underworld was created more than 60 million years ago. Now, how far down does this cave go? 
uh, the system, the older system, have 25 kilometers. 25 kilometers 25 is the entire system? This entire system, yes. So there's mm -hmm. many Ex different... Explore it, explore it system, because maybe are another few kilometers which is unexplored yet. Wow. Yes. And so it, it branches off into many different tunnels and everything, and this is just one yes, of the many. Yes, and the different, uh, different levels. Okay. Or something like that. Big jump. <laughs> Going further down into this cave. It's so cool. Okay, don't be very careful here. Oh, yeah? Always slippery, huh? Okay. This massive cave we were exploring stretched down four levels. So the best way to get into it was to repel. My favorite part of adventure. <clears throat> so we can't get there by the trail, so... Harnessing up. Professionally harnessed. These guys are good. Okay. It was a 120 foot drop that would lead to the deepest cavern in this system. You have another 15 meters. This is the last level of that cave. Man, this is beautiful. Wow. Listen to the echo. Hello! Jesus, this place is big. You got a lot of caves, you got a lot of bats. Yes. It's kind of understandable how people could make the connection between Romania and vampires. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, good. Yes. So there could be vampires in here, who knows? Why do you think Romania has such a reputation for mystery and legend? I mean, what gives the place that quality? In my opinion, the first reason is the Jack. <laughs> right, you know? the book. The book, yes. The book was written by Bram Stoker in 1897, over 400 years after Vlad Dracula died. And the setting for the book's famous Nosferatu is modern-day Romania, the landscape of which is filled with caves like the one I was exploring. So who was this real-life prince who in seven short years left behind a legacy of terror? His story begins in 1431, when Vlad was born. It was the 15th century, an incredibly tumultuous and brutal time in the region. Dracula got his name from his father, who was a member of an elite society called the Order of the Dragon. It was an elusive fraternity founded by the Holy Roman Emperor in 1408. In Romanian, Dracul means dragon, so his father adopted that as his nickname. And Dracula literally means son of the dragon, or son of the devil. The Ottoman Empire and the Hungarian Empire were the major powers, and the province of Wallachia sat in the middle of the two. Arch enemies, the Hungarians and the Ottomans both used Wallachia as a pawn, and Vlad became a crucial piece in their game. When young Vlad was only 12, the Turks helped to get his father back onto the throne of Wallachia. But to repay them, Vlad's father had to send Vlad and his brother to the Turks as hostages. If their father tried to double-cross the Turks, the boys would likely have been killed. But the Hungarians were circling Wallachia, just waiting to attack. And to make matters worse, Vlad's father was hated by those he ruled. So in 1447, his subjects joined with the Hungarians and went in for the kill. Dracula's oldest brother was buried alive and his father was assassinated by his own people. After his father's death, the Turks released Vlad with their own agenda. They appointed him officer of a Turkish army to help him avenge his father's murder and claim the throne. Just 17 years old, what Vlad Dracula was about to do is far more terrifying than fiction. Romania's landscape is as rugged as its history. Castles and fortresses are everywhere but none are more foreboding than those inhabited by Vlad Dracula. In the 15th century, Wallachia's relationship with its neighbors, the Ottoman Empire and Hungary, was volatile. Alliances constantly shifted with the wind, and the backstabbing continued even while Vlad was in power. He returned to Wallachia in 1447. His reign of terror soon began, and for the next 30 years, the Wallachian throne changed hands several times. 
While the myth of Count Dracula is frightening, the story of the real man is downright terrifying. And it all started in Tregovista. Prince Vlad Dracula returned home, his father assassinated, and his brother buried alive. He was surrounded by enemies, Ottomans in the south, the Hungarians in the west, and always assassins operated from within. To defend his title, he fortified his capital, Tregovista, against attack and plotted a revenge so bloody, so gruesome, that it would one day earn the young prince a new title, Vlad the Impaler. At the time, Turgovishta was the capital of Wallachia, which is now part of modern-day Romania, and was the site of Vlad Dracula's family fortress. Parts of the castle at Turgovishta still exist today. It's just a shell of what it once was. But what happened here would cement Dracula's grim legacy. And today, the evidence is 30 feet beneath the castle. Petru Virgil Diaconescu is an underground expert who could take me down into Vlad's secret world, and Ramona Niakshu came along to translate. Hi. We started at one of the most intact parts of the fortress, the tower. Ah, so this is Vlad's tower, huh? Yes. Man, it's beautiful. Before we went underground... Okay, we can climb if you uh, wish. We needed to go up. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow, this is it, huh? This is where Vlad Tepes stood, looking over his lands of Wallachia. Wow, amazing. In 1462, 15 years after his return to Wallachia, alliances had changed again, and Vlad was against the Turks. The Turks counterattacked, entering Wallachia with an army three times as large as Vlad's. He retreated to Dragovista, leaving a path of destruction in his own homeland. He burned his own villages and poisoned his own wells along the way so that the advancing armies would have nothing to eat or drink. But the worst was yet to come. When the starving Turkish army finally arrived at the doorstep to Dracula's fortress, a scene from a horror film lay before them. Vlad had impaled 10,000 people, including women and children. He watched from the tower where we were now standing as the impaled slowly died. Incredibly, he actually made the stakes out of the trees. They were the wow. actual trees. They were the actual trees. With the roots. Yes, it That's... was a tree with bodies in it. Oh my uh. God. So he left these bodies on these spears for months. His tactic worked. The Turks were horrified and retreated, crying along the way that the devil himself was at Turgovista. But this wasn't the first time Vlad caved in to his bloodlust. He used torture and impalement as an effective tool to keep order in his kingdom. He routinely rounded up enemies and brought them to a secret prison. That secret prison still exists. It's actually located 30 feet beneath this castle. It's off limits to the public, but I was going in. Oh, wow, look at this. So this is the actual yes. prison cell for his this prisoners. This is the prison cell, yes. Here were held until uh, they were convicted. I see. But here we have two rooms, uh, two ide this identical rooms, yes. From right. here we, we are uh, entering another room. Let me go in here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it's about the same size as the other one. This is Vlad. The Impaler's jail cell. I don't think I would want to spend a day of my life in prison by Vlad the Impaler. Yeah, not a lot of room, but here it is. This is the original walls, right? Yes. Original foundation. This is the original foundation. We are standing beneath the palace. We are underneath the palace underneath here. The palace. Yeah. The room I was in is thought to be one of the prison cells beneath Turgovista. It was part of a massive underground complex of dark dungeons and elaborate torture rooms. And 30 feet above this complex would have been Turgovista Castle itself. At its peak, the castle was an imposing and impressive structure. 
towering 88 feet into the sky. And the subterranean prison I was exploring was built to withstand the pressure from this massive castle up above. While the castle has crumbled today, thanks to the simple Roman arch, these dungeons have remained. The prisoners who were brought here knew what might be coming. They could be impaled on a stake alive and left to die. You know, it's one thing to hear about these guys, how vicious they were. It's a whole other thing to see where he kept his prisoners. It's creepy to be thinking about being down here by yourself in the dark, condemned to death. There's no way around it. It is a bizarre feeling. These dungeons hidden deep below the castle were strictly off limits to anyone except Vlad and the few he trusted. In fact, most had no idea these rooms even existed. Vlad didn't want any of the prisoners' relatives or friends to know where the dungeons were in order to prevent rescue attempts. Prince Vlad kept the prisoners here until their trials were over. He was the judge at these trials, and for those who were found guilty, the end result was often impalement. They were held here for two or three days mm -hmm. until the judgment was uh, pronounced by oh. the prince. Okay. And during this, ti this time, they were uh, interrogated and... Uh, I have a feeling he didn't find many people innocent. We don't know that. We yeah. don't have many documents that say Vlad Sepesh was an unfair man. Mm. He was a very just man. You could be in prison down here for anything from lying to stealing to infidelity. Vlad's goal was to keep a tight grip on order in his kingdom, and it worked. During his reign, crime and corruption were wiped out. That's why even today, many Romanians remember Vlad as a hero and not a murderous madman. Vlad punished these crimes by cutting off limbs, skinning, boiling, or roasting people alive. But impalement was his method of choice, and it was a slow death that could last days. The steak was usually oiled, and Vlad made sure the point wasn't too sharp, so the victim wouldn't die immediately. The stake was inserted into the victim and their own weight would slowly send the stake through their body. But Vlad's victims didn't always know they were about to meet their deaths. He once invited the sick and poor to Dagovista for dinner. He then locked the doors of the hall and set the room on fire, essentially eradicating poverty in Wallachia at this very castle. But this underground prison was just the first of many strongholds Dracula built, both above ground and below. In 1457, Dracula built another fortress 40 miles northeast, even more imposing than the first. It was called Panare Fortress, and it was the next stop in Dracula's blood-soaked underworld. Oh, wow, look at that. He was a guy who took it to extremes, look at that. Right there on the hill, amazing. It's a 1,500-step climb up the steep hillside just to get to the entrance. Oh my God, look at this. Oh, he could rule, he could command, he could do everything from up here, man. On both sides, it's amazing. The Arges River and the valley, and if any Turks come up that valley, man, you know it. My guides, Adrian Sandu and Ketelin Stoyan, were waiting for me at the end of my ascent. That's quite a climb. Yes. <laughs> How you doing? Fine, thank you, and uh, you? Thank you, hello. And hello. welcome to Poyanari. Thank you, it's incredible. After years of earthquakes, Panari is now in ruins. But in the 15th century, it was a formidable structure. When he came to power at Turgovista, Vlad's first order of business was to avenge the death of his father and older brother. But it would take over a decade to carry out his master plan. One Easter Sunday, Vlad served a feast to his own subjects, some of which had helped to murder his family. He then impaled the old and weak. Vlad ordered the able-bodied men to march 40 miles from Turgovista to Panare and forced them into labor to expand his fortress. In the end, after months of slave labor, no one survived. Many of the nobles were literally worked to death, and those left breathing were impaled. What is this? Oh, man. This was a dungeon. The dungeon? Of the fortress, yes. Okay. Part of what Vlad's captives built is a dungeon 12 feet beneath the surface. Usually it's off limits, but I was given special access down. Be careful. Yes. Down in Dracula's 
dungeon. You really feel like you are uh, jailed for life down here. <laughs> yes. So how many people did he keep down in this place? Just a few people. Yeah, just a few prisoners? Yeah. Because he used to impale them very quickly. He didn't have that many prisoners because he impaled yes. them before he put them down here. Wow. But there's more. Though today this dungeon is in ruins, 500 years ago it would have been under four levels of the castle. And directly above this room would have been Dracula's master bedroom, where he could hear the cries and pleas of his prisoners only a few feet below him. Panari was one of Dracula's strongest fortresses, but it was also the site of one of his greatest tragedies. Vlad's mass impalement didn't keep the Turks away for long, and in 1462 they retaliated. This time they came prepared. They put Dracula's own brother Radu in charge of a massive army and surrounded this castle. There seemed no way out for Dracula. His wife refused to be taken alive and threw herself off the tower to her death. But Dracula would not surrender. He vanished into the Romanian underground. According to legend, Vlad Dracula disappeared into escape tunnels carved into the side of the mountain, and with the help of local peasants, fled to a nearby province called Transylvania. In 1462, the Turks, led by Vlad's brother Radu, took control of Wallachia. Vlad fled via underground tunnels to the province of Transylvania in Hungary to ask the king for protection. But instead of a helping hand, Vlad suddenly found himself in prison. Vlad the Impaler terrorized his people for five long years until 1462, when he was the one running for his life. He was captured and held for years as a political prisoner. But even the thick walls of this fortress couldn't contain Dracula's evil ways. His bloodlust continued in the dark dungeons of this medieval castle. It is called Hunendora Castle. The original fortress was built here during the Roman times and over the centuries was transformed into the castle that held Dracula. It has seen sieges, withstood cannon fire and was even burnt to the ground many times. But despite its active past, the skeleton of the castle is still here. And my guide, Sorin Tinku, knew exactly where the off-limit places were. This is only original door that we have. This is the sole original yes. door. Oh, wow. It's made from oak with uh, iron. That's beautiful. This is another area that we are not showing to the tourists. Okay, private access. Today, yes. Huh? What you can see in here is the wall from the uh, 14th century. I was getting special access into the 14th century fortress believed to have held the man behind the myth between his second and third reigns. But seven centuries ago, this castle would have looked much different. The old fortress had only a single tower and was built on a solid bedrock foundation with stones gathered from nearby mountains. But in the 15th century, it began the transformation into both stronghold and palace. With tensions still high with the Turks, it needed to be safe but it also needed to be a castle fit for a king. In 1441, the Hungarian king added seven towers. He also added grand halls, guest rooms, and a chapel. The unique engineering combined late Gothic styles with early Renaissance, making this castle an architectural marvel. But that's not all. By building a castle on top of an existing fort, he created an interior and an underground. Sorin led me to these restricted passages deep below the castle. Hey, look at that. <laughs> wow, how cool. Oh, it keeps on going. This underground tunnel was quickly put to use to defend the castle in the brutal Middle Ages. During a siege, these subterranean spaces allowed the king to live comfortably up above, while his loyal army was down below defending him. So this is where the battle is waged? Yes, <laughs> yes. The gunfighters uh, standing here with a gun hanging on this wall because it was very heavy. Uh -huh. well, we are now facing the first guns in the history. And this one uh, is a hole for ventilation because it was a lot of smoke sure. and the <laughs> they could die in here. Yeah, yeah. This maze of military tunnels snaked all through the castle. Let me show you another part of that tunnel. 
But this palace's underground is an important part of Dracula's darker days. Let me show you the dungeon of the castle. The dungeon at Hunadora Castle is one of the few prisons to have ever held Vlad the Impaler. Wow, so in this here. is cool. Yes. This is the prison cell. Yes. Jesus, these were not nice places to be. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, dark and dank, baby. I'm pretty cold. Wow. You just don't want to be held prisoner <laughs> in a place like this. Do you know for sure? <laughs> This prison cell was small and made of stone. There was no heat, and during the cold Transylvanian winters, the temperature could fall well below freezing. Vlad ended up in here as a result of the constant power struggle in the region. His brother Radu, who held the throne in Wallachia, was allied with the Turks, and Vlad's imprisonment secured Radu's place of power. Much like when he was a child, Vlad was still a valuable pawn. So when he came to the Hungarian king for help, he was imprisoned. Like most dungeons in medieval Europe, this isn't some place you want to spend the night. It's a dark and eerie subterranean space. Experts believe Dracula spent 12 years in prison here, and while confined to a cell, the former prince kept up with the impaling. He would stake spiders, roaches, and even mice. According to prison guards, he skewered the pests with slivers of wood peeled from the floorboards and displayed the impaled like trophies on his windowsill. Supposedly, Dracula was mesmerized after impaling his victims. They say he would fixate on their tiny death twitches until they finally stopped moving. In prison, Vlad remained the impaler, and outside, alliances shifted once again. After 12 years of captivity here, the Hungarians set Dracula free. In 1475, he got his chance to reclaim the throne when his brother Radu died of syphilis. A year later, Vlad reconquered Wallachia. Today, few realize that beneath this castle sits a subterranean space that once imprisoned one of the world's most ruthless leaders. Vlad's reign of terror wasn't the only treacherous period in Romania. During World War II, Romania found itself making and betraying alliances once again. In 1940, Romania joined sides with the Axis powers, supplying the Axis with oil, grain, and other industrial products to fuel the war machine. Because of this, Romania became a main target of the Allied forces. By 1944, Romania switched sides, and then it was the Luftwaffe targeting Romanian soil. But regardless of alliances, during World War II, bombs were a constant threat. The Romanians needed some place safe to hide, and that place was underground. I was heading to a little known treasure buried beneath Transylvania, to a massive salt mine that could provide salt to the entire world for 100 more years, and was the perfect spot for a bomb shelter. a long and mysterious passageway, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. My guide, Don Mera, knew the salt mine story better than anyone and could easily navigate these immense dark tunnels. How long is this? 526 entry? meters we will pass through this tunnel and then we will enter the salt mine. So 1,500 feet, this is the... Yes, it and is. And how far below the ground are we? About, uh, right now we are about uh, five meters and then we'll be 10, 15 and so most we're about 50 meters. 50 meters down. This mine is among the largest in Europe, covering almost 54,000 square feet. That's more than an acre. And it's among the oldest and most important in Transylvania. The color is surprising of this. I mean, it's quite... Yes, actually, the walls are black. Um, natural color of salt is white, and, uh, the, and massive salt is translucent. But in the Second World War, the salt mine was used as a shelter. Huh. And that is why the walls are black. They made fire here to get warm and to prepare food. During World War II, Romania lost much of its land, and Vlad's former empire was essentially cut up into pieces. Romania sustained heavy bombing throughout the war. 
thousands sought refuge in the empty salt mines like this one throughout the country. This empty cavity in particular was the perfect bunker. It was 150 feet below the surface and could sustain massive bombings, and its arch-supported ceilings ensured the shock waves from bombs couldn't destroy it. When the war was over and people moved back to the surface, Romania was under communist rule. The Iron Curtain wouldn't be lifted until 1989. But the history of this salt mine goes back much further than World War II. In fact, this natural salt deposit is 13 and a half million years old. So you're saying this solid wall is all salt? Yes, it is all salt. It is it it's tasted. Is. You can't really <laughs> okay, taste it. Okay, I'll take that it little is. piece there. That's salt. Yes, it is. How much salt is down here still? There's about uh, 38 billion tons of salt. 38 billion tons of salt yes. still remaining in these mines. Yes, exactly. I can't even conceive of how much that really is. On this site in the second century, the Romans began mining this precious commodity, a process that would continue to be done here by hand until the 20th century. Today, the mine is made up of several large rooms, some over 100 feet deep. Uh, all the salt mine was done by hand, so only really? hand tools, nothing, no explosives or uh, other uh, machines or mechanical machines. So are we seeing pickaxes? Is yes, that... exactly. Huh. Everything And was how done many people there. were working down here? Uh, the most uh, were about uh, 300. Long before the salt mines provided safety to Romanians, they were seen as a source of income for the different generations and civilizations that lived here. Salt was as good as gold and was used as currency in the ancient world. Roman soldiers were paid with salt, or salarium argentums, the root of the English word salary. The Greeks even traded salt for slaves, creating the expression, not worth his salt. Down this way, huh? So the person with the salt was the one with the power. That meant I was walking in an ancient gold mine. Look how huge this big, place isn't it? is. <laughs> Unbelievable. How high is that? That is 40 meters. 40 high. meters, 120 yes. feet. And if I was up there, what year would that have been? Nin 1868. 1868, and we're yes. standing where? 1932. <laughs> so they did all that in about yes, maybe. 50 years. Amazing. When Vlad came to power, the abundant salt deposits of Transylvania were still being mined. Vlad Dracula also used the seemingly innocent commodity for more sinister actions. It is said that he would skin the feet of his prisoners, coat the wounds in salt, and let goats lick it off. Just another way to keep order in his volatile land. From the Romans paying their soldiers, to Vlad's use of salt for punishment, to saving lives in World War II, these salt mines have always been an important lifeblood in Romania. Vlad Dracula ruled the province of Wallachia three separate times for a total of nearly seven years. But it's what he left below the ground that's most impressive. Over the years, Vlad had gained himself many enemies, but some of his greatest enemies were members of his own family. At the time, there was no clear plan for succession of the throne, which meant that all princes within the dynasty had the right to rule. So brother fought brother for power. During the height of his second reign, Vlad built a new palace on the outskirts of the province. It was a fortress that would solidify his power. In 1459, Vlad turned a small fort in the remote town of Bucharest into a princely palace now called Curtiaveke. He built a massive citadel and surrounded it with his loyal subjects and wealthy merchants. And Bucharest soon grew into a political and economic power. Unfortunately, like a lot of medieval buildings, the palace was ravaged by constant warfare and fires, and today, much of Curtiaveke is in ruins. But deep beneath the ground, a small piece of Vlad's grand palace still remains. Gabriel Constantine was my key to getting into one of Vlad's most famous fortresses, and Monica Findlay would translate. And Vlad to welcome us, huh? Vlad, yes, he's our friend. <laughs> <laughs> he looks very stately today. Okay, let's go inside. Today, the entrance is easy to miss. But just 10 feet beneath our feet lies the very foundation that established a new capital. 
It's amazing, it's huge, huh? This subterranean space is all that remains of the fortress responsible for the development of modern day Bucharest. Long before the bustling metropolis existed here, this area was a sleepy village of farmers and small merchants peddling their handicrafts. When Vlad arrived, he took an ordinary observation tower and transformed it into a 10,000 square foot fortress complete with a royal residence and marketplace. But this was more than just a place for local farmers to sell their crops. It was where Vlad Dracula established his slave trade. Vlad allowed non-Christians, criminals, and captured Turks to be sold as slaves. And soon this area began to thrive. But little do they know that this boom in economic and cultural development would eventually light the spark for the founding of modern-day Romania's capital city. Traces of Vlad Dracula's original design still remain, if you know where to look. So I can see the wall Yes, the original wall as well, there, yes, it's right? from that time. But this is different here. Yes. All right, so we have the different eras of construction. This being Vlad Tepes's fortress with the river stone and the mortar. And this is a newer construction, and that's much newer over there. For almost two centuries, Vlad's successors built their own extravagant castles right on top of the existing structure, essentially burying all that remained of Vlad Dracula's original design. Today, these passageways snake beneath the streets. But in Dracula's days, this would have been the ground floor of his palace and marketplace. To later rulers, it would have been the basement. They expanded Vlad's palace, creating a structure even larger than his 10,000 square foot complex. It contained a private garden in the middle, and administration buildings and living quarters would have been directly above the rooms I was in. In the late 18th century, a new castle was built not far away, and eventually this castle fell into disrepair and homes were built around it until finally, during the communist era, buildings covered the entire area, effectively paving over Romania's dark past. Most have no idea that this piece of Dracula's life still exists. But if he had never built this retreat, Romania's capital city of Bucharest might never have been. Vlad Dracula built Curtiaveca at the height of his power. But just a few short years later, his final reign would come to an end but not even his death could bring an end to his legacy. Ask any Romanian where Vlad the Impaler is buried, and they'll tell you about a darkened church on a remote island accessible only by boat. But like his life, Vlad's death is shrouded in mystery. Some say his skeletal remains were stolen. Others say he's buried near his treasure of gold or in a tunnel that runs beneath the lake. Whatever the case, Vlad seems to have eluded his fate once again by going underground. In ancient myths, souls often have to cross a body of water to reach the afterlife, the underworld. So somehow it seems fitting that we have to cross a lake to reach what legend says is the Romanian burial site of Vlad Dracula. Approaching it, you wouldn't think that this deserted looking island could be just 25 miles north of Bucharest. Snagov Island is so secluded, it's easy to imagine Vlad Dracula wanting to spend eternity here. But much of his medieval island retreat has crumbled with time. Donna Matache is a guide trying to get to the bottom of Vlad's legend. She agreed to take me to see the real life Dracula. That is really something. Oh yeah? Yeah. It was built by Dracula by his order. This yes, well here. This one here. <laughs> yes. So it is from 15th century, middle of the 15th century. Oh, yeah, there's water down here. There is and it's very good. First of all, Dracula built a prison, mm -hmm. and with the prisoners, he built this fountain. I see. Really, they dug with their hands. During the construction of this well, Dracula is rumored to have placed a bag of gold next to it as a symbol of his power. He claimed that as long as he lived, no one would touch the gold, and he was right. Legend says the gold remained there until the day he died. But the, the gold isn't here anymore. Ah, uh, he Somebody died, unfortunately, it. he's no more living, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But there's one structure on the island that has lasted through the years, an 11th century church, Vlad's chosen burial site.
feel his <laughs> presence. Oh, here we go. There he Look is. Look at him. Look at him, hello, please. Hello, hello. Yes. He is here. Vlad the Impaler. Yes. This Vlad is his tomb. This is his tomb. Yes, this and is his, his tomb. His remains are under here now? We think so. This is the mystery. Some of the people says that he couldn't have been buried in a church mm. after many things he did. Just about every aspect of Vlad Dracula's death and burial remains a mystery. Most sources say that he was finally killed in battle and beheaded by the Turks in 1476. The Turkish version ends with Vlad's head displayed on a stake in Istanbul as visible proof of Vlad the Impaler's demise. But those who revere his legacy say that his friends buried his head on Athos Mountain in modern-day Greece. So why not put these rumors to rest? In 1935, a group of archaeologists tried to do just that. But what they found buried beneath the site where I was standing brought more questions than answers. They discovered some uh, rich growth, very fitted for a prince. They discovered a special ring with uh, the coat of arms of Dracula. But Vlad's bones were never found. Much like the many myths inspired by Bram Stoker's vampire, Count Dracula, many mysteries surround the fate of the real life Vlad the Impaler. Today, Dracula's regions of Wallachia and Transylvania are part of modern-day Romania, and Vlad Dracula has left a lasting impression there. But his legacy goes well beyond the fortresses, churches, and even the capital city he helped to create. Vlad ruled for a short span of nearly seven years. It's hard to fathom, but during that time, it's said he killed between 40 and 100,000 people. Mystery will always surround the real-life prince called Dracula. And who knows what other secrets he's left for us in the underground. In the middle of modern-day Turkey lies a region that was under siege for centuries. This lunar landscape is called Cappadocia. Jeez, it's magnificent. And beneath its quaint villages, roads, and farmlands is one of the largest subterranean battlefields in the world. First carved out by the pagan Hittites over 3,000 years ago, hundreds of underground cities span for miles and have endured the bloody wars, religious battles, and constant conflict that have always threatened to destroy them. From tunnels rigged with booby traps. Those are for the spears. They kill the enemy by the head. Oof, and that's not gonna be pretty to the clandestine roots of Christianity. This is the first monastery of the world, and it's huge. There are approximately a couple hundred churches around this area. And the remains of an advanced pagan civilization that mysteriously disappeared. Cappadocia has secrets inside every cave. Let's go up here and take a look. And around every corner. It's like a, a beehive. It's a honeycomb of tunnels that just go in every direction. Signs of the evolution of ancient warfare have been buried for more than 3,000 years. We're peeling back the layers of time on Cities of the Underworld. Secret Pagan Underground. For thousands of years, this mysterious region has been a battlefield for invading empires. But hidden beneath its quaint villages and bizarre terrain lie massive underground cities and traces of a mysterious pagan empire dating back 4,000 years. I'm Don Wildman. I'm in Cappadocia, Turkey, land of lost cities. This lunar landscape was created millions of years ago by the eruption of three huge volcanoes, and it is unlike any in the world. 
For thousands of years, people here have been digging in the soft volcanic rock, creating a vast mega metropolis below ground. There's over 100 square miles filled with heavily fortified castles, secret churches, dungeons, entire underground cities built to defend the locals against the armies of history's most powerful empires. For generations, villagers have guarded the secrets of Cappadocia's underworld. But as the modern world collides with the ancient one, those dark secrets are revealed. The region of Cappadocia is located 200 miles south of Ankara, the capital of the modern Republic of Turkey. It sits in the center of the high desert of central Anatolia, a nearly 300,000 square mile peninsula that encompasses most of the country. This region has always been the center of mysterious activity, from supposed magnetic fields with healing powers that locals swear by, to a history of UFO sightings going back thousands of years. Today, its unique landscape makes it a popular tourist destination, but its dramatic terrain conceals a hidden world. Throughout the region, hundreds of underground cities and fortresses dug into the mountains connect to create one of the most massive subterranean networks in the world where entire civilizations fought their bloody last stands and secret religions were spawned. I was on a quest to find the mysteries that lay hidden in this otherworldly region. My first stop was a towering rock column called Uchisar. I've been told this is one of the most important and oldest citadels, this huge rock right here. It's all dug out with tunnels all throughout. Man, it's incredible. Look at this, I mean, it's just like this over here. All the tunnels all throughout, and this entire valley is just like one huge underground. Let's go up here and take a look. Oh yeah, you can see how much they've dug out here. Whatever this was, it's just huge amount of effort gone into this. Incredible. Look at this. It doesn't smell so good in here. 3,500 years ago, this was one of the three major citadels in the region for the pagan tribes that lived here. These rock fortresses were the key to survival in those brutal days, a time when tribal warfare could wipe out entire villages. It's like a, a beehive. It's a honeycomb of, of tunnels that just go in every direction. Wow. As a natural high point overlooking the valley, Ujisar made for the perfect defensive location. But how did primitive ancient people dig this massive structure out of solid rock? To find out, you have to jump back millions of years to when volcanic eruptions created this totally unique moonscape here on Earth. Over millions of years, the three major volcanoes surrounding the region spewed volcanic materials across the land. The first eruptions left a layer of soft rock called tufa. The subsequent eruptions left a much harder layer of basalt. This dense material created a protective surface that slowed the erosion of the underlying tufa. Eventually, rain and wind blowing sand into the tufa rock began to erode it, creating these huge plateaus and fairy chimney rock formations that span for miles. The tufa was soft and easy to carve, but why go through the trouble of digging a city out of the earth instead of building one up above? Cappadocia's long and bloody history may give us a clue. Cappadocia was always a highly coveted and equally dangerous piece of real estate. It sat directly in the center of the major trade routes that connected the world's great empires, from China, India, and Egypt in the east to Greece and Rome in the west. That meant whoever controlled Cappadocia controlled the trade routes and was guaranteed a hefty share of all the riches carried along it. Everyone from the Romans to the Persians to the Mongols fought bloody battles to control it. That and tribal warfare made this a dangerous place to call home. Oftentimes, the local pagan population found themselves drastically outnumbered and outgunned. So to defend themselves, they had to create another world below the ground. The soft tufa rock left behind by the volcanic ash that blanketed the region 10 million years before was easy to carve and the hard basalt layer on top provided protection. So the Cappadocians started to dig. They began with simple rock shelters and eventually transformed those into huge underground cities and fortresses like here at Ujisar. Some of these subterranean cities could support as many as 20,000 people and did so for 25 centuries up until the 1300s. Locals relied on their underground cities to keep them alive. 
But when the Ottoman Empire finally stabilized this region in the 14th century, villages began to thrive on top, and some of these cities that saved their ancestors were sealed up and forgotten. In the 1960s, locals started to explore the closed-off tunnels beneath their homes. They had heard rumors of their ancestors' subterranean existence, but no one could imagine how vast these cities were. Today, over 200 cities have been found intact beneath Cappadocia. Experts believe there are hundreds more just waiting to be discovered. I'm in Urgup, the main city in this area. There's one woman here who knows everything there is to know about Cappadocia. I'm gonna go see her now. Elva. Hi, Don. How are Hi, you? Hi, good. So this is your hometown, huh? Yes, this is Irgip, one of the main towns of uh, Cappadocia. Uh -huh. I can see there's a rock formation right here in town. They're everywhere. This is just the beginning. Elvan Osbe has been exploring this underground for nearly 20 years, and no one knows Cappadocia's hidden secrets like her. She wanted to take me to a place you couldn't find on any tourist map. It was an untouched underground city belonging to the region's first empire, the mighty Hittites. The Hittites are considered to be one of the most advanced empires of the ancient world. They reigned from 1700 BC to 1190 BC and are thought to be the first Cappadocians to start living underground. But what do they have to be afraid of? No one knows for sure, but their ancient writings reference a time of troubles from invaders they called the Sea People. The pagan Hittites appear to have flourished in the region for over 500 years. But in the 12th century BC, like another great and mysterious civilization, the Mayans, they vanished without a trace. The underground of Cappadocia was their last refuge, and I was going to see one of their very first subterranean cities. Elvon was taking me to Gototoprek, a place few outsiders have ever seen. Villagers have always known of its existence, but the rest of the world is just now learning about it. Where are we going here? Well, we're going up there. That's the original entrance of the underground city. Oh, really? So these caves go throughout this entire it face does, of rock? It does, actually, yes. And the villagers say all around, wherever you see this rock formation, there are caves and tunnels. God, cool. So this is the entrance here? This is the entrance here, and this is the original. It's oh, very really? rare. Mostly the original entrance is collapsed, you know? Uh huh. Watch the spider web there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not open, I'm telling yes. you. Yes. <laughs> oh, but it's a big room in here. Wow, look at this. Look at the bats. Right there. This is amazing. With the exception of treasure hunters who scour this region looking for treasures left behind from the mysterious Hittites, the underground city here has been mostly untouched. Elvon said its crude construction meant it was one of the first and oldest cities. Cappadocians became more advanced in underground living as the threat up above forced them deeper and deeper into the ground. As rival tribes or the mysterious sea people approached, these villagers abandoned their lives up above and prepared to wait it out down below. What are these holes over here? They're the wells for water storage. There are two kinds of wells. Uh -huh. These are called dry wells. This is where you store the water. Okay, so the water was brought here? Yeah, brought here and stored okay, in here. Okay, poured right in. Yeah, and there's another system, which is called the wet well. And they grew these waterways and then direct the water inside the underground city uh -huh. and then directly into the well. So it was like a, an aqueduct, a primitive aqueduct system. Uh, yeah. They had water, specially carved out ventilation shafts, and months' supplies of food. But that wasn't enough. They needed protection. Throughout these narrow tunnels snaking from room to room in the underground city were remnants of an ancient defensive system used during times of siege. They've got another defense here, another millstone to roll into place, because I guess there's an important room down this way. Millstones weighing up to a ton were rolled in front of the entrances to shut off access into parts of the city. It was simple and genius. 
Because the stones were round, inside the rooms, just a few men could easily roll one of these stones into place. But from the other side, even an army couldn't budge it. This was the first evidence of the complexity of life in these underground cities. And who knows how many ancient people died right here, fighting in these tunnels. <laughs> Here's, this most stone's actually in place. It's been rolled into block of way. And I mean, this has been here for 3,000 years, because no mortal man, certainly not me, can move it. You can see, oh yeah, down this hole, the tunnel just continues on. But we ain't going there. I had already found evidence of an underground battlefield and advanced engineering left behind by the pagan Hittites. But what I had just seen was only the beginning. Four thousand years ago, the Hittites, a powerful and advanced pagan empire, arrived in Cappadocia and around 1200 BC dug into this volcanic soil to create lethal military force. They lived like ants in their subterranean cities, warding off invaders. When they mysteriously vanished in the 12th century BC, they left massive hand-carved cavities beneath the ground, cavities that would become increasingly useful in the first century AD, when another persecuted group, the Christians, came to town. And in Osganok, a small village in the northern region of Cappadocia, this exotic new religion was able to take root and flourish underground. I met up again with Elvon, who knows the underground of Cappadocia better than anyone else. Because Osganok is the third largest underground city in Cappadocia, the local government installed a secure entrance to prevent treasure hunters from stealing any precious artifacts. This is the entrance. Excellent. Let's go. But I was granted special access inside, and once in, I knew exactly what they were protecting. So this is the carved out stone we're seeing. Yes, and we're at the first floor of this underground city, which was used as a stable. Okay. They were bringing their animals in with them uh -huh. and tying them here. Oh, I see. So yeah. they actually roped them up. They roped them up. And they carved them right out of the rock. Yeah. What yeah. is this? Uh, these openings long? These openings are for their eating. Oh, I see. This is their dish. So this is totally functional. There's just functional. a bunch of hay That's, there. This and is everything. where they eat. Oh my god. Look, they're. So there's a space above? Space above, space be below. below. Jeez, <laughs> Everywhere, it yeah, ventilation. Keeps going on. Yes. We were standing on the first level of a multi-level city. The animals occupied the first level, and the villagers took cover on the second level, 18 feet beneath the ground. In fact, over 3,000 people could live in this massive complex for months at a time. It was essentially an ancient version of a modern bomb shelter. If they went to all this trouble to build something so far underground and so vast, the threat they were facing must have been enormous. When they were first attacked by the Arabs, they were throwing burning bushes through the shafts. The ventilation yes. shafts. And people were in the first floors were dying because of the smoke. So they decided to go deeper and wider. They needed more protection every year. As the military threat grew, so did the undergrounds. That's exactly what happened. It all started in the first century AD, when Christians began to use the underground to escape persecution from Roman soldiers. In the year 303, the last and most aggressive persecution was launched. Thousands of Christians throughout the empire were hunted and killed. But it didn't end there. Muslim Arab armies continued the Christian persecution, but when they arrived in the villages up above, they found a ghost town. Three secret tunnels in the village and passageways underneath homes allowed the Christians to quickly retreat to safety. Once the invading armies realized the villagers were sitting ducks beneath their feet, the real battle began. But little did they know, the Christians were ready. In the underground cities, you have very narrow and winding, slopey tunnels. Okay. The first reason is air circulation. When you have these slopes, 
the air circulates much faster and better. So it compresses the air. Compresses the air and directs to all around the underground city. The second purpose is for the enemy. Yeah. You cannot go all together. You and I cannot walk in there together. So this is we a protection. We need to go one by one, mm -hmm. and we need to bend down. <laughs> and if we have weapons, we need to put them down. Yeah. And like walking like this. Okay. So, so this, this is disarms the reason. The enemy. Yes, this arms the enemy. Ah, interesting. That's why. Oh, that's cool. The narrow tunnel would slow the enemy assault to a crawl, and for those determined enough to go through, there were more surprises ahead. What are these? Those are for the spears. The spears? Yeah, just in case the enemy gets all the way here. Oh my god, yeah. so they're actually, oh, I can see all the way up here. Yes, So they, they kill the enemy by the head. So the if, if you've gotten this far in your attack, you're not you're gonna dead. go any farther because they, <laughs> no, got, they got you this way. <laughs> wow, oof, and that's not gonna be pretty. But the defensive traps didn't end there. Yeah, all right. I'm Even if you were saved from the spears, uh -huh. You can't go any further because of this, the door will be closed in front of you. This door comes in, into play. It was a millstone used to trap an enemy, just like the ones I had seen at Gotcha Toprek. And while the Christians have the Hittites to thank for first carving out these fortresses centuries before, they deserve the credit for taking the idea of a subterranean booby-trapped battlefield to a whole new level. One of the new tactics they came up with was to let the invading armies enter a main room roll the millstones to cover the only two entrances and essentially trap the army inside until they died. As if that wasn't enough, just beyond the door was yet another deadly obstacle. In this room, up here. This is a very famous Byzantine system. Pour hot oil over the enemy. So you've managed to get inside this room. Inside, and now you're killed there. by the oil. Oh my God. Yes. If the Christian villagers had retreated this far into their underground, it meant they were desperate. And we were standing in the last room carved out in this complex. It was the war room for the defending army. The room from where the battle between 3,000 villagers and their heavily armed enemies was run. But how? What are these holes up here? Well, these echo my voice. This is the only underground city where you see telecommunication system. The echo in this room is much better than the other room. And it's gathered and through this hole up here, uh -huh. carried to the other floors. Like an acoustic theater, this room was built to reverberate sound waves and channel them into a single area. A person in the room above could hear instructions given below, even when spoken at a whisper. Orders and enemy positions and movements could be communicated throughout the complex, a last line of defense against a determined enemy. But even after the threat of an attack passed, locals would wait down here until they were absolutely sure the coast was clear. That meant living underground for months at a time, so preparation was key. This is the most important thing in an underground city. Right. They need to store food, even if they're not using it, even if they're up, up there in their houses, they store the food. Okay. And because they need it when they stay here. And it's a very good cold cellar, essentially. Yes, the temperature is perfect in these underground cities. The temperature down here was always the same, 15 to 16 degrees Celsius. It was the perfect temperature to keep food fresh, centuries before the advent of refrigeration. But the Christians went one step further than just storing their food. They knew any kind of contamination could quickly turn a subterranean city into a mass grave for 3,000 people. This is chalk. Uh, most of the underground cities had used this system to paint the walls uh -huh. with chalk paint. Which most of the places white. like storages, kitchens, and uh, places where they need hygiene, uh -huh. they had uh, chalk paints on the walls. And this is an underground city where you can see the chalk. The volcanic tufa rock that created the landscape of Cappadocia flakes off easily. Its particles fill the air and cover everything in a layer of thick tufa dust. So coating the walls of their subterranean food storage areas, wineries, kitchens, even hospitals, with chalk was considered hygienic and helped to prevent contamination. The size and scope of Osgonok illustrates just how deadly the threat of attack was. And building this massive complex wasn't easy. In one day, it is estimated that one man using a chisel could only carve a five foot by five foot area. So an entire city, two and a half floors deep and one mile long, was quite a feat. 
But for those whose lives it saved, it was time well spent. In the fourth century, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And after centuries of hiding out in these subterranean cities, Christians could finally come out of the underworld. Even though the Christians were finally free to practice out in the open, they chose to stay underground, expanding on the subterranean cities and creating a Christian stronghold away from the eyes of the world, right here in Gareme. I was about to see the evolution of Christianity, hidden inside the caves of Cappadocia. Jeez, it's magnificent. It was hard to imagine that this valley was hiding hundreds of churches, from crude caves to intricate basilicas that rival the great cathedrals of Rome. But even more amazing is that this very site was one of the first Christian education centers in the world. This is the first monastery of the world, and it's huge. There are approximately a couple hundred churches around this area. These caves were used to create the first monastery of the official religion of the largest empire in the world. Monks ate, slept, and prayed in seclusion here. A solitary yet communal lifestyle like this had never happened before. The idea of monastic life came from St. Basil in the fourth century. Christianity was at its peak, and he was alarmed by his own materialism. He had lived with hermit monks in Egypt and expanded on the idea. So here in Cappadocia, he created a massive self-sufficient community of monks, the world's first monastery. They lived here until the 14th century when the Ottomans took control. This subterranean solitary world is the basis of monastic life as we know it today. But that's not all St. Basil did here. He was actually able to excommunicate those involved in prostitution trafficking, so common along major trade routes like Cappadocia, essentially cleaning up the remnants of the area's pagan past. But of the hundreds of churches and dwellings here in this monastic complex, one specific underground structure stands apart from the rest. It is believed to be one of the earliest dwellings here in Gareme, dating back over 1,000 years. Today, it's a Christian world of the dead that's been dubbed the Snake Church by locals. This one is a very good example to the primitive church. Okay. This is a burial place, so watch your step. Right. Don't fall into the grave. Okay. These are, are graves here, huh? Yes, these are the graves. Gee. There were bones found inside these graves. Really? And, and these too, these small um, ones. Yeah, they're children's graves. Oh, wow. It's proof that an entire community of Christians, men, women, and children, lived in this very spot 10 centuries ago. But how is it still standing? Just like today, the 11th century Christians knew they couldn't just dig haphazardly into the hillside. So throughout the region, every 18 feet of digging required a supporting wall or column, and this monastery was no exception. This medieval form of building codes helped ensure the world's first monastery could survive 10 centuries later. When the Ottoman Turks conquered Cappadocia and stumbled upon this subterranean world, they were impressed with the engineering that kept these structures standing. And even more impressive was that the ancient frescoes on the walls hadn't been exposed to the elements, preserving the stories of the world's first Christians underground. We have these famous Cappadocian stories painted on the wall. They are from the Bible, of course, but uh, these are local stories. All right. Someone tried to do a fresco, but you can't even see the face, you know, very primitive. But graves and crude frescoes are only just the beginning. Not far from the Snake Church, there's another church with even more elaborate frescoes. Yeah. Isn't this beautiful? It's gorgeous. This church was built around the same time as the Snake Church, but its frescoes came later, showing just how much more advanced the Christian artists had become. 
And these are local artists painting these churches, the intermediate ones. But very skilled hand. A very skilled hand, but you really don't see lots of color combination. Reds and blues, basically natural colors. And these churches were normally used to teach Christianity to illiterate people. That means this 1,000-year-old room was much more than a church. It actually doubled as a school of Christianity. In the Middle Ages, it was very rare to find people who could read. So these intricate frescoes were used like a textbook, telling the stories of the Bible in pictures. If this church was a message to the local people, the next one was a tribute to God himself. It was the biggest and most ornate of all the churches in Gureme, and for seven centuries it has remained intact thanks to the strong tufa walls into which it was carved. Oh, it's really amazing. Yeah, you can see the difference in sophistication, detail, the color, and ceilings are high. How beautiful. Yeah. Oh, this is spectacular. So this is the first part of the church from 11th, 12th centuries, mm -hmm. and these are the frescoes about the biblical stories. So this is the life of Jesus from his birth to his crucifixion. There's so much detail, so much work involved. The frescoes on the ceilings and walls of this cave turned church rivaled that of any church throughout the Byzantine Empire. Some of the world's finest artists were sent from Constantinople to paint these spectacular murals, a sign of Cappadocia's importance to this emerging religion. But it was the engineering used to build this church that was even more amazing. This is cathedral architecture. Right. I mean, the depth and the height, and there are double layers of columns and mm. inner niches. And they've gone to the trouble of the uh, details. details. This church resembles the layout of those of the Eastern Roman Empire. It had an apse at one end to symbolize an opening to the kingdom of God, a main central prayer area supported by four columns, and two smaller prayer areas to the sides. The design is similar to the churches found in Constantinople, but this one was carved into the ground entirely by hand. Driving by Gureme Valley in Cappadocia, few realize the holes in the hills lead to a massive monastery, the first of its kind in the world. From Christian classrooms and massive basilicas hidden inside caves, to blood-drenched pagan battlefields more than 18 feet beneath the ground, centuries of constant digging created another world here, and I had barely scratched the surface. The Hittites, the early Christians, the Romans, and Mongols had all ruled Cappadocia, adding their own layers to its massive underground. Today, every house, shop, or road here could hide an entrance into one of these lost worlds. And Elvon was taking me to a town that sits on top of a five-level subterranean city, extending nearly four miles. But it's not the size that's most impressive. The 1900-year-old architecture sits 20 feet beneath the ground and actually inspired some of the greatest engineering feats on the planet. Mehmet Asmanbashilu, the mayor of Ayanas, a small village outside the city of Kayseri, agreed to take me into the bowels of the sealed-off underworld. Let's go down. It just so happens that the best way to get down is through the basement of the childhood home of one of the world's most influential architects. Down here. His name is Mimar Sinan. After you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. So, we are entering into his house here. This is where he lived. They say this is the place when he opened his eyes as a baby, he saw these arches. These arches here? Wow. Yes. So these were actually features of the house. These arches are very important because those are the influence to his uh, later life. 
Mimar Sinan, born in 1489, right here in this house, went on to build some of the most impressive monuments of the Ottoman Empire. His most famous was the Suleymaniye Mosque. It was built for Sultan Suleiman and standing 170 feet tall, it's the largest mosque in Istanbul. It has one of the biggest unsupported domes in the world. Amazingly, a building of this size could never have been built without the engineering feat found right beneath Sinan's childhood home. It's a triple arch system. This system builds on the same idea as the simple Roman arch. The weight from above is distributed throughout the sides. So with three arches sharing a central axis, the load-bearing capacity triples as well. It's a simple but ingenious way to make the most of a single column. But why was the triple arch used here in the first place? This underground city is believed to have been one of the newer ones in the region, first inhabited by the Romans in the second century. As each new generation moved in, they expanded the city both above ground and below. Nervous that the world up above could cave into the one below, they put triple arches throughout the underworld. The technique worked. 1900 years later, these second century walls can still hold up the thousands of pounds bearing down on it from the modern town that continues to grow above. And we go this way. But there's something else that sets this city apart from the rest. Oh, man, look at these little amazing spaces. I mean, it's like a set piece. Today, homeowners have blocked off spaces beneath their homes for storage. But 500 years ago, during Sinan's time, this system was an uninterrupted three and a half mile long subterranean factory. I cannot get over how vast this whole underground of this house is. I mean, and this is what kind of room here? They are making uh, iron utensils in this room over here. They melt the iron in that hole. Wow. The terracotta molds left behind were once used to make tools out of iron. But what was created in the next room was a matter of life and death. Now, what is this room? What was this used for? It's a workshop, mm -hmm. and it's also interesting because uh, there is a pigeon house inside the workshop. Oh, really? You know why? Why? because they're making gunpowder out of the pigeon poop. Many ancient civilizations considered pigeon droppings a precious commodity. Cappadocians had known for centuries that this bird excrement was high in nitrates, and they often used it as fertilizer. But after the invention of firearms, they realized this highly explosive substance was perfect for making homemade gunpowder. And over 500 years later, I was standing in the middle of a subterranean weapons factory. So Sinan lived above this, a whole working complex down whole there. whole working complex. They believe living here and not being an architect is not possible. <laughs> this is a perfect laboratory <laughs> this was for a, a great one. architect <laughs> exactly, yeah. to, to be raised among. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> this perfect laboratory for Mimar Sinan is an invaluable time capsule today. And few people know that everything from the beginning of ancient factories to arches that inspired the world are all right here, buried 20 feet beneath this village in Cappadocia. In the last 50 years, around 200 underground cities have been found throughout Cappadocia, and new ones are found all the time. In fact, just recently, archaeologists discovered another lost city, but this was no ordinary find. It may be the largest and most sophisticated underground city in all of Turkey. It's still being excavated today, but it may rewrite history. This latest discovery buried beneath Cappadocia is unlike any other. It's located in the town of Gaziamir on the western edge of the region. The locals always believed they lived on top of another world, but they had nothing to prove it. So the government gave them three weeks to start digging and see what they could find. A group of villagers got together, and no sooner had they broken ground than they uncovered a time capsule dating back seven centuries to the dangerous days of the Silk Road. Wow, there's just new excavation everywhere here. Everywhere, yes, there, there, there. I can see all this excavation going on. Archaeologist Guzin Karoke is in charge of this one-of-a-kind dig. 
Merhabalar, merhabalar. So this is the new underground city they found. The Silk Road was the major freeway of the ancient world. It was the lifeline that allowed people to get from one place to another, transporting everything under the sun. Incredibly, it extended 7,000 miles, which meant that rest stops were needed. And when it came to rest stops, the Turks went big. Here, beneath Gaziamir, sits a caravan sarai, or a fortified four seasons of the ancient world. Experts believe this complex might go back 800 years. This rest stop fell out of favor in the 14th century, and hundreds of years of dirt and debris buried it beneath the ground, until three months ago, when they cleared away the mud All right. and exposed the newest piece of Cappadocia's past. So all of this was underground before. Today, we were the first to ever be given access into this unseen underworld. Well, off we go. Isn't this beautiful? Jeez. I'm so surprised to see a place like this. It's gigantic. But what was such a massive caravan sarai doing beneath Gaziamir? This village sat strategically on the busy 7,000 mile Silk Road. Caravan sarais like this one were built every 18 to 25 miles, the distance a camel could cover in a day's travel. It's hard to tell today, but 800 years ago, this would have been an impressive sight. Travelers from all over the world would have entered through a massive guarded gate. Security was always a major concern. Once inside, there were stables for their animals, storage room for their goods, sleeping quarters, baths, wineries, a central room where food was served, and areas for doing business. In essence, it was a city of its own. Caravan sarais like this one cover 50,000 square feet, more than an acre. Without these caravan sarais, long distance trading would have been virtually impossible. Fountains, baths, and wineries where guests could unwind after a long day of travel made it well worth the hefty price guests paid to stay here. What is this here? That's, <laughs> that's the cork. <laughs> so this kept the wine yeah, safe. Yeah, that's the cork. How beautiful. But the luxurious life the innkeepers provided their guests was only a temporary escape from the outside world. In fact, in the 13th century, this entire region was sketchy. This four-star hotel was smack dab in the middle of a war zone. Most of the local villagers took refuge in the underground cities I had already seen. Travelers on the Silk Road needed security too. The Eastern Roman Empire was left weak and vulnerable by the Fourth Crusades in 1204. Muslim Turkish tribes had infiltrated the area and were constantly at war with each other and anyone in their path. And brutal Mongol invasions were always a threat. Not to mention gangs of thugs and thieves trolling for victims, looking to steal the expensive camels and their cargo. Wow, Don, look at this. Yeah. This is not like the tunnels we've been to. No, not at all. It's huge, for one thing. I mean, literally, the tunnels are big. The tunnels were used as corridors to get from room to room. At 10 feet tall, they were larger than most, yeah. Right. Yeah. but they had to be. Asian camels used on the Silk Road could be as tall as seven feet and weigh as much as 1,500 pounds. Oh, I see, it splits off in two yeah. here. Yeah, the camels, the, the animals were taken out this way, <laughs> the see. slope. The big I'm... wide tunnel here. Yeah. <laughs> Travelers from all over the world, mostly rich merchants carrying their goods camelback, would have stopped here to rest after a long day of travel and trade. In this courtyard, they would unload their goods, everything from silk to spices, and tie up their animals. Animals were precious cargo, and they were well cared for at the caravan sarais. A staff of veterinarians, saddle makers, blacksmiths, and stable hands would have been on site. So this entire room is filled with camels. <laughs> I guess so, I guess so. Oh, well this looks like a bone. Oh, my God, that's a jaw. It's an ancient camel jaw. And a top. Yeah. Hey. Oh my God, that's a little gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> From the 13th century? Yeah, most probably. I'm gonna leave it right there. 
In fact, this archaeological site here is the only one in Cappadocia to have ever unearthed camel bones. Just three months into this dig, the archaeologists have already unearthed unprecedented relics from the ancient world. But they've only dug out a fraction of this caravanserai buried here beneath Gaziamir. As they continue to excavate, who knows what else they'll find. For now, the mud is the only thing separating the past from the present. Like ancient time capsules, these underground cities preserve Cappadocia's dark and mysterious past. From the harsh existence of the Neolithic era to the brutal warfare of the Dark Ages. Today, like their ancestors, locals are once again moving back into these ancient caves, turning them into boutique hotels and luxury homes. But next time they want to renovate, they knock down a wall or dig a new well, who knows what secrets they'll find hidden in the caves of Cappadocia. At the turn of the 20th century, America was home to one of the most dangerous vice-filled cities in the world, Portland, Oregon. Today, it's among the country's most desirable places, but it secretly harbors an underworld darker than you could possibly imagine. Whether it's trap doors used to kidnap unsuspecting victims. Jeez, they fell right into a holding cell. The eerie recesses of a drug utopia. So this is an actual <laughs> opium den, huh? The lost stash of the city's bootlegging queen. You can see oh, there's plenty of stuff still Look, in there. There's old whiskey bottles. Or even an illegal underground fight club. Portland has more dark corners than any medieval dungeon, and danger looms around every corner. We are in a hazardous atmosphere right now. Right, we we, need, we need to vacate right. this hole, right? The sins of Portland's past are alive and well. They're just buried beneath the surface. We're peeling back the layers of time on cities of the underworld. Underground bootleggers. I'm Don Wildman, I'm in Portland, Oregon. And for nearly a century, this was America's vice city. Walking around today, you'd never know it, but Portland's seedy past is buried just below its streets. A hundred years ago, this was a wild west port town where you could be kidnapped and sold into slavery, where gambling, drugs, prostitution, and murder were on every street corner. Today, Portland is a model city, clean, safe, progressive, but look beneath its cosmopolitan coffee houses and bookstores, and Portland's sordid, dark past is soon revealed. America's Wild West has numerous tales to tell, but few are more shocking than the story of the tiny settlement, originally known simply as The Clearing. This no-man's land would quickly flourish into a thriving port, but the civilized face of the streets above was only a mask for what was really going on down below. In the late 1800s, Portland was known as one of the most dangerous ports in the world. For sailors coming into the city, it was easy to find a good time. Speakeasies, drug dens, and brothels operated right under the nose of the local police. But for the rough and tumble mariners, the lure of a good time could turn deadly. They'd wander into a bar or a brothel, and suddenly a trap door would drop open and they'd plummet into a dark underground. They didn't know it yet, but they'd just been shanghai The practice of shanghai was all too common among the shipping ports of the West Coast. The term comes, of course, from Shanghai, China's largest city. And it all goes back to the Opium Wars. In the 19th century, opium was illegal. The Chinese emperor had it outlawed a century earlier. But the Western powers, hungry for a healthy profit, paid no attention. The British imported massive amounts of the drug into China, getting the Chinese hooked. In 1839, when the irate Chinese emperor seized more than 20,000 chests of opium, Britain fought back with a stronger army and forced China to turn over several ports to British control. Soon, other Western nations like France and the US gained access to the coveted Chinese ports. Shanghai, now controlled by the West, became a den of vice and corruption, and its popularity skyrocketed. So how did Portland connect to this international drug war? With China now open for business to the West, ship captains needed sailors, and lots of them, for these lucrative journeys to the Orient. 
but they had trouble convincing men to ditch the allure of the gold rush to set sail for Shanghai. The trips could take years to complete, pay was notoriously low, and living conditions aboard the vessels were deplorable. Ship owners hired local thugs to drug or kidnap able-bodied men and stow them away on their ships. When the men came to, they found themselves in the middle of the Pacific with two choices, work as a slave or be tossed overboard. I met up with Michael Jones. Hey, Michael. An expert on Portland Shanghai tunnels and he was gonna take me down into the expansive underworld of this city's sailor slave trade. All right, this is where you get Shanghai. Huh? This is where you still get Shanghai. Few people realize it, but right in the middle of a modern day street, an inconspicuous opening actually leads to the off-limit network of tunnels. And Michael is one of the few who has a key to this subterranean door. Now you're venturing into places that uh, a lot of people went into and never came back up through this section. There was no other place like this through the entire United States. So we are underneath of a working restaurant. Yes, this is hobo storage space, but once you reach the dirt, when you cross from the concrete to the dirt, you are officially in the Shanghai tunnels. I see. These tunnels stretch for five miles underneath the city. So this is all, this is the tunnel that, that we're talking about here. This is it, this is the real McCoy. And can be found lying dormant beneath modern day homes and businesses. They were constructed of both brick archways and wood support beams. Simple and practical designs that would keep the world above from ever knowing that the ground beneath its feet was being hollowed out. These tunnels first appeared in 1850, before the city was officially incorporated. The official version is that they were constructed strictly to transport goods from the ships at port to the hotels and saloons scattered throughout Portland. But the real story is much seedier. In 1870, these tunnels became infamous, and for nearly 50 years, an entire industry of human trafficking was just below the unsuspecting public above. Did they actually construct it for that purpose? I mean, yes, yes. Wow. And, you know, some people like to say it's used to bring goods in from the, from the waterfront so you didn't have to, have to go above ground, yeah. but it was actually for Shanghai. So right above our heads is a bar, and was in those days too, a Lazo saloon. saloon. Lazo's Saloon was one of Portland's most popular hangouts. Today, Lazo's is known as Hobo's Restaurant, but more than 130 years ago, it was in places like Lazo's where unsuspecting men would get sucked down to the underground. Guys were, were assaulted upstairs and brought down into this space here. Yeah, generally they did it a little bit nicer. They. Uh, they utilized the drinks in, in the bars, uh, spiked them with knockout drops when they were woozy, dropped them through a trap door on the floor. Wait, so you're just standing in a bar, doing nothing, and all of a sudden the bottom drops out on you, and down you come. Right, but you're drunk, and everybody else is drunk around you, and they don't know what's going on. So this whole thing was a setup. I mean, the bar tender was involved, the owner of the place, the whole thing. And a lot of times the Shanghaiers were the secret owners of those saloons. So everybody was making money. I see. And how much money were they making? $50 a man. With that type of price per man, making it out of the saloon didn't mean you were safe. The tunnels took us beyond the limits of the saloon, underneath the actual streets of Portland. And just around the corner from Lazo's was an alley with a nasty surprise. This trapdoor here is actually in a dead-end alley. That means at the far end of the alley, you forced your victim into that section, and then... Jesus. They fell down here. They fell right into a holding cell. Christ. But the captains needed healthy men for their long voyages, so every precaution was taken to deliver a good product. Wow, what are these things here? These are Victorian mattresses. They were used in the houses of prostitution. <laughs> when they wore out, they brought them into the underground, put them beneath, the trap doors, so when the victims fell through the trap door, they were not injured. Occasionally, they died, 
but it wasn't generally on purpose. Right. Well, that's nice. The Shanghaiers needed to be careful themselves. The strong men they kidnapped wouldn't be in the best of moods when they came to underground. This is where they held them. These are the actual bars. They're very unique. They're not made with round stock and square stock. And if you notice, these bars are deep and they're tapered. That way, if the Shanghai are standing behind these, yeah, this yeah. cell, the victim can't reach through and grab them. Because if they can grab them, they're not going to turn loose. So how many men would be in a cell like this? Like sardines. Really? And if a prisoner actually managed to escape, well, the Shanghaiers were more than prepared for that. Look at all this stuff. What is this? When they grabbed their victims and brought them to the underground, they took their shoes. Really? Because the Shanghaiers broke glass and spread throughout the underground. So if you escape, Jeez. they can always follow the trail of blood. So this is a logger who came in for a drink and ended up on a boat shipped out around the world. <laughs> exactly. But he left his shoes behind. Just another eerie reminder from Portland's seedy days. Left underground. A century ago, just beneath the freewheeling Portland streets, a coiled labyrinth of tunnels was home to the ruthless Shanghaiers, locals who would drug unsuspecting men and drop them into cells built in Portland's underground. Before long, these unlucky loggers and cowboys found themselves swabbing the decks on the high seas. Shanghaiers were brutal and unpredictable. Sometimes they would pack as many men as possible into these tiny cells. Their victims would wake up completely unaware of what had happened or where they were. It's hard to imagine, and yet countless people were put through this. And I had just seen this vast complex of tunnels beneath Portland, but there was more. This place is so vast. I mean, it keeps going every direction. Yeah, it makes you believe it goes on forever. <laughs> and if you haven't been here in the darkness and shadows by yourself, yeah. you haven't experienced what you need to experience. Pretty eerie, I guess. Huh? So you need to go on down here. And All right. This is more of the Shanghai tunnels. Huh. Look at this. I mean, it goes out this way as well. And then down below us is two more floors. Wow. You can just imagine, I mean, all the terrifying things that happened down here. There was one area in particular where the original cells are still intact. What do you find over here? This is a, uh, a holding cell, and it's very small. It actually goes between the buildings. This crawl space up here, you mean? Exactly. Can you get up here? Yes, there's a ladder over here. All right, let's go get it. This was in an area that they had to share with rats. Rats. This was the worst place to be, and that's why they kept these men pretty well drugged up. Right above me is a working church in the middle of its service right now. And down here below, all this is a holding cell. A holding area for for kidnapped men, Shanghai men in the 1800s. They would be stashed in here like sardines. I mean, just smashed in and held for however long it took to get them on board a ship. The whole town is filled with these, these small crawl spaces, these tunnels. It is awful to think of this fate. Whew. Most likely, you'd be dragged to the river just three blocks away and sold. But there were other places and other people hiding in the Shanghai tunnels. We'd started in the basement of an Old West saloon and found ourselves winding beneath the alleys and streets of Portland. About 50 feet from the Shanghai's prisons was a secret room nine feet below the surface. And what went on down there was even more profitable than Shanghai. Where does this go? We're going into a completely different building. In fact, every time you go through an archway, you're in a, between buildings or in a new building. I see. What is this place? Well, you've stumbled onto a white slaver cell. Because oh. white slavery was big business here in Portland. White slavery was the cleaned up term for something far worse, sexual slavery. And it began in these claustrophobic cells, measuring only 14 square feet. In the 19th century, prostitution was running rampant. In some places, the age of consent was just 13, and young girls were often forced into a life where they sold themselves on a daily basis. These women were grabbed from restaurants, dances, and right off the street, brought into the underground, locked up in what was nothing more than a, a very tiny double-walled closet. Logs lying the outer corners so they couldn't kick their way out or beat their way out. 
and they kept them in total darkness, total isolation with the objected break their spirit. In order to break the women down, white slavers would degrade and torture them, but not physically. The slavers, like the Shanghaiers, needed their product to be in good physical condition. Their torture was purely psychological. The young girls and women would then be sold as prostitutes or shipped off as sex slaves to places like Chicago, New York, or even foreign ports overseas. Oh man, it is so sad. These girls were forced into the bowels of Portland, but not everyone came down here against their will. Just 60 feet away from the sex slave cells, we stumbled upon yet another use for these passages. Wow, so this is an actual <laughs> opium den, huh? Yes, it is. Jeez. This is this is the real thing. They came down into the opium den. They would purchase their opium here, which they were going to smoke in pipes and go on their opium dreams. <laughs> opium dens were another constant in Portland's underground and in many port cities along the West Coast. They were designed exactly like this one, with numerous bunks. Patrons would lounge here and smoke for hours on end without ever leaving this tiny 100 square foot room. And because they needed a relatively safe place to smoke, they would rent themselves a bunk. Uh-huh, sure. This is an opium bunk. The bunk that was closest to the ground was the most expensive. Because when you fell out of bed, you didn't have far to go. I see. Well, you can understand the comfort. Yes. <sighs> From kidnapped men to sex slaves and opium dens, the hidden horrors of the Shanghai tunnels are only a few feet beneath the streets of Portland. With all the dangers lurking in any common hotel, alleyway, or saloon, what kept the fast-blooming Rose City so popular? This port had a reputation for keeping its secrets. At the turn of the century, what happened in Portland stayed in Portland, and it would need to. This salacious town, along with much of the United States, would soon find itself mired in a struggle that would erupt into one of the most crime-ridden and hard-living periods in the nation's history. Above ground, the town remained high class. But that prim and proper image was just a front. In reality, this city was supplied with more booze than it could handle by a secret world of smugglers and bootleggers hidden in the city's vast underground. These thugs were rampant throughout the city and across the country, and it was all a result of a battle of morals that started over 50 years earlier. Prohibition began in 1920, but its roots stretch back to the mid-1800s when religious groups formed to combat social drunkenness. They preached and protested in nearly every state, and their one and only solution was to outlaw alcohol entirely. But the plan to outlaw booze backfired. The crime syndicates in places like New York, Chicago, and of course, Portland, hit pay dirt. Gangs thrived and liquor flowed underground. I met up with James Louie, the president of Portland's oldest restaurant, Huber's, and it was his great uncle Jim who ran it nearly 90 years ago during Prohibition. This is the original room. Yes, going back to 1910, we're on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, we've been in business for 128 years now. Originally, this place was an Old West saloon, but when Prohibition began in 1920, a new chapter in Huber's history was written. Instead of closing up shop, they converted the saloon above into a restaurant. And the real action happened down below. Through an off-limits door, we descended 10 feet and headed nearly 90 years back in time to an illegal speakeasy. So this was where the speakeasy would operate. That's correct, Don. Do you know what it looked like? I mean, well, the uh, from what I understand, the walls were painted in kind of a tropical scene. Oh, really? Kind of like the Caribbean, because of a, no, but without any windows. Oh, okay. Uh, you had to make it look lively okay. and inviting, right? Oh, yes, exactly. So it was a fully operating bar scene. Absolutely. 
Today, this area is just used for storage for the modern restaurant up above. But nearly 90 years ago, this tiny corridor would have led to a parallel underground world devoted to keeping Jim's most important customers fully satisfied. But getting into this secret world wasn't easy. First, if you managed to find the entrance, you'd be asked for a password or a secret knock. Once you'd given up the correct code, only then would you be allowed access to a paradise of music, women, and booze. So these places had to operate in secret. I mean, these they had to find places that the law wouldn't find them and store their booze down here as well. Supply was the most important part of maintaining a lucrative speakeasy. With alcohol banned across the entire country, an owner needed a connection, someone to keep the glasses full and the taps from running dry. How could a place like Huber's continue to serve a steady stream of alcohol and keep its reputation intact? Enter the bootleggers. Bootlegging was the trade du jour during the Roaring Twenties, and it made gangsters like Al Capone and Bugs Moran millionaires. Imports of Caribbean rum, Canadian whiskey, English gin, and French champagne could bring in as much as $200,000 per shipload, at a time when $50 was considered a good weekly wage. In Portland, most of the alcohol would arrive via large motherships just outside of U.S. waters. Smaller ships, or contact boats, would dock with them and buy their spirits. After loading up, these small ships would have to evade the Coast Guard on the lookout for illegal smugglers. But with smaller and faster boats, the bootleggers wouldn't have a problem, and they made sure their valuable merchandise was well protected. The motherships were known to have machine guns mounted on their decks, and on land, trucks were closely watched by men armed with knives, pistols, and Tommy guns. But in Portland, it wasn't a king who ruled the bootleggers, it was a queen and she reigned supreme over the city's underground. Today, few people know that beneath this unassuming modern-day graphics house rests the secret sanctuary of one of America's wildest bootleggers. Come on in, let's show you around. Right. Dave Campa owns the graphics business that now runs up above. But in 2004, he discovered that nearly 80 years ago, it was another business that had set up shop down below. 10 feet beneath the ground floor was a nerve center of one of Portland's most notorious bootlegging operations. Oh, wow. So this is the newest part of the building here. This whole section here was actually added on in the late 40s, we believe. It was originally built as a uh, retail marketplace. It was an Italian market. This uh -huh. was a big Italian neighborhood back then. Um, it had a full service uh, meat market. In fact, you can see the original uh, sign oh, yeah. is still here on the back door. Jack Spratt says it takes good meat to make a good meal. And that's been here as long as we have. Really? Well, that's pretty snappy. So that was what was going on upstairs. Yes. But something altogether different down. Absolutely. <laughs> Let me show you that. All right. We're going to need these flashlights. Okay. It's pretty dark down there. All right. Welcome to our dungeon, and be careful walking down, it's okay. awful dark, so. Just 10 feet below the streets are the leftovers of a bootlegging stronghold known as the dungeon. And this is the old boiler room. In its heyday, this subterranean space would have been overflowing with stacks and stacks of whiskey piled to the ceiling. Back in the 20s, this is where the old building ended. The staircase we were climbing down didn't exist. Instead, a concealed back door would have opened up to a tiny closet, and inside was a trap door and a ladder leading down into the bootlegger's subterranean lair. The boiler room was the perfect place to store the booze that quenched the city's thirst. This thing's been around here a while, since the 27 when they <laughs> built it. Kind of Man, that is a relic, Jeez. isn't it? Not only was it concealed beneath the busy trade of the market above, but it also provided a quick and effective solution for getting rid of the booze in case of a raid. This incinerator would have held more than 25 whiskey bottles, and if things got really bad, all it would have taken was a flip of a switch, and any trace of the alcohol would have gone up in flames. Yeah, but you can oh, see man. there's plenty of stuff still in there. There's old whiskey bottles. Who knows? Who knows? And then there was another one down here also. So who was it that kept this place stocked to the ceiling? 
it wasn't a gangster or a hard-nosed mob boss. Instead, this was the dangerous den of Prohibition Rose. She started as a madam, operating several houses of prostitution. And when other avenues opened up during Prohibition, she seized the opportunity. She uh, earned her name by coordinating uh, the transportation and the distribution of a lot of oh, alcohol really? in the Portland. She was her own microbrewery. Pretty much, she was the first microbrewery <laughs> in this area. Rose's type of whiskey was typically made in a large continuous still, a device specially designed to distill whiskey without ever stopping. The first column heats fermented grain by steam, resulting in a semi-liquor gas that is fed to a second column. Inside this second column, the alcohol-rich vapors rise through perforated plates. Once they cool, the stripped water flows to the bottom, while the alcohol is collected at the top. The result? An alcohol concentration nearly 50% higher than other common stills. So above our heads, a teeming Italian market. Correct. Down here, stacks and stacks of whiskey, Correct. boxes of whiskey. She had caches all over the city. She also had inside information on when raids were coming, I think, through payoffs. Uh -huh. And she had made sure that all her brothels had booze all the time. Uh -huh. So she was a one-woman operation almost. She, she was. She was making it and delivering it and distributing, and it, distributing all it here. Yes. Even though Rose was careful to pay off the local authorities, occasionally even she had close calls. One of the most famous stories was she was in one of her brothels. Uh -huh. The police were raiding the place. The men were running around trying to figure out what to do with the booze. So Rose said, stack all the booze in the center of the, of the floor there. When they did that, she lifted up her dress, pulled it over, and stood on top of it. <laughs> when the police broke down the door, they found nothing except Rose in the center of the room, reading the Bible. One of the reasons I don't think it, there's not a lot of history on her, because she never got busted. 13 years after Prohibition, uh -huh. Sheriff pulls up to her house up in Alder Creek and rolls down the window. She was out front and says, it's time to give it up, Rose. Times have changed. Shut her down. Wow. And she did. She, they tore the steel apart, closed all of her houses of huh. prostitution, and she lived for quite a few years up on Mount Hood. Wow. Good life. The days of rampant crime and corruption in the city of Portland are long gone. Its once seedy waterfront is now lined with multi-million dollar high-rises. But Portland is a big city and crime isn't entirely a thing of the past. In fact, if you know where to look, evidence of Portland's criminal activity is still flowing underground. Today, Portland's waste flows like any other cities, through the sewer. But mixed in with the water and sewage are signs that an illegal drug world still exists underground after all these years. The city's sewer system began as a small wooden trough built in 1864 to collect the waste along Montgomery Street. But as bootlegging and the drug trade took over the underground, the sewers became overridden with disease and pollution. And today, things aren't much different. I met up with Chris Schindler, one of Portland's finest, but he's not a police officer. Yeah, another day at work down the hall, huh? Another day in the hall. He's a sewer maintenance technician. Equipped for everything here. Well, equipped, I can't say for everything, but <laughs> you try. And he was about to show me a world where innumerable dangers could claim your life on a daily basis. All right, we're going down there? That's where we're going. Can I get ready? Let's do it. There's your gear right there. Let's, let's, let's hop in the hole. There's a lot of gear to prep, and it's all for a very good reason. Chris has had more than one close call down here. Today, Portland sewers have expanded to over 2,200 miles of tunnels, 4,400 catch basins, and several thousand manholes. It's gone from serving a few businesses and homes in the mid-1800s to over half a million people. And if the waste was a problem over 100 years ago, the trouble has increased exponentially with the city's growth up above. What's the worst stuff you've ever seen down there? Uh, high flows are the scariest. Yeah. Um, pump stations that turn on. There's rats. There's vandalism, which could be shopping carts, wire. Um, shopping carts? Uh, it, it amazes me how they get a shopping cart in a 24-inch manhole, <laughs> but, uh, but they do it. Yeah. And then it's my problem to get it out. 
But that's not the half of it. Every day he's down here to make sure that Portland's underground keeps the world up above safe and operational. That can mean anything from repairing damaged sewer pipes with brick and cement to building dams or even thawing blocks of ice that have lodged in the lines. But the worst dangers are unseen. All right, so you're telling this what to test for. So this tests the four known gases we have, H2S, carbon monoxide, oxygen, and lower explosive limit. That is the gasoline solvents. OK, so um, when it reaches a, a dangerous level, this thing goes off. And like it will sound like this. Mad dog. This okay. is the sound that we do not want to hear. All right, cool. These gases come from a mixture of human waste, chemicals, and bacteria. Ah, there we go. Good morning. If their concentrations are too high, it can knock you out, or worse. Down! And once all the precautions were in place, I dropped down into an underworld where danger exists every day. It looks deep, and it looks dirty, and very, very tight. Coming down. We headed 30 feet beneath Portland streets into the middle of a 2,200 mile network of waste and refuse. All right, so we ready to go? We are. Let's rock. According to Chris, one of the most destructive and deadly forces in the sewer is drug trafficking, mainly of a drug called crystal meth. When you say dangerous, what happens down here? So meth labs, they're getting raided by the police, and they dump them down the they're, toilet? Usually, if they're getting raided, they're running, yeah. and they're not worried about dumping it. Um, it's the operating meth lab that I worry about most. Oh, really? The one that flushes all their, their bad stuff down the toilet. Meth labs are a constant problem. Oregon is struggling with meth trafficking more so than any other state today. The drug is easy to create and can be made in nearly any type of environment. But while easy, the process is extremely dangerous and toxic. The chemical gases are so dangerous that you can die just from inhaling them. But even worse, when extracting the chemical, the solvents needed can easily explode. So fires and powerful explosions are a frequent side effect. Chris not only has to worry about the poisonous gases and contaminants from home meth labs above, but also needles, glass tubes, and wires that are flushed down as well. A single cut or wound exposed to the bacteria down here could be deadly. And we got a taste of the danger that lies beneath the streets. You can see the water perking through here. Sure, sure. You know, this is, this, is go this is clean groundwater. We're not right. too worried about this as a contaminated source. But what we do worry about is the mortar. I see. What's that beeping? We're getting a, a level, a LEL level, which is a lower explosive limit. So if, Somewhere up there must be a, a chemical of some type coming oh, really? through. It's, and, it's, and we uh, can't smell anything ourselves. Uh, I, I can't smell it right now. So um, the canary is singing. Chris decided not to risk it. We are in a hazardous atmosphere right now. Even though we're on air mass, we, we should not, ought not to be in here. Right, so we we, gotta we gotta need to here. vacate right. this hole, right? We immediately went up to the surface. And once back above ground, we had to be hosed off as an extra precautionary measure. But that was only the beginning. Whew. Well, that's a bit cleaner. There are a lot more of Portland sewers to explore. My next stop was called the Big Pipe. The project will clean up the river and the city and help prevent catastrophic environmental damage from future flooding. I met up with Greg Calzani, who was gonna take me down into this massive project. I was getting an exclusive look. Just come over to the shaft here. All right. Oh, man, look at this. Greg is the construction manager for environmental services. The big pipe is their pet project, and it's a monster. It's part of a 20-year process that will cost the city of Portland over a billion dollars. A gigantic tunnel will run for six miles over 100 feet below the ground. By 2011, this wastewater treatment system will help reduce sewage overflow by a whopping 96%. God. Hold on to your hat. You don't want to send it down the Ooh. roof. That is a huge hole. Why is it so big? We have to support the mining operation. As you can see, the tunnel boring machine down in the shaft, just the magnitude, the size of it. There will be seven of these giant shafts throughout Portland, but they're only temporary. 
They're here simply to provide access for the drilling process for a six-mile subterranean megapipe. But to really understand this engineering marvel, I had to go down, way down. So we get lifted by the crane? Yes, the crane will pick us up, swing us over, and lower us down the shaft. Just digging this shaft has taken nearly a year to complete, but now comes the hard part. about four and a half miles to the, to the north. We'll take the machine apart, bring it back, launch it, and finish the rest of the tunnel. In order to stop its toxic pollution and to help prevent disastrous floods, the city came up with this state-of-the-art engineering stunner. The big pipe will be created by a tunnel boring machine. It burrows through the earth and at the same time leaves behind it a concrete lining with the segments bolted together in seven different sections. In order to lift each piece, which weigh over a ton, they use a vacuum erector that sucks the segments up, moves them to the correct position, and stacks them into place. Once all seven pieces are bolted together, a segment of the pipe has been completed. Six miles and four years later, it will be finished and ready to save the city from future catastrophes. Nearly a century ago, Portland ignored the drugs, booze, and human trafficking spread throughout its underworld. But today, in the same soil where vice and corruption were the norm, Portland Subterranean is helping bring the city into the future by correcting the mistakes of its past. Throughout the U.S., Prohibition unknowingly created an overnight syndicate filled with booze hounds and bootleggers, gangsters and corrupt officials. Instead of curbing the drinking, it created a seedy subculture hidden behind the facades of soda shops, restaurants and hotels. And here in Portland, the dry movement actually had the opposite effect. It opened up the floodgates. Prohibition never slowed down the business of booze. It just sent it underground. Truth is, Portland's hardcore criminals never had it so good. The sale of moonshine only fueled the city's other illicit activities. Speakeasies became places to satisfy your every desire, from drugs, gambling, prostitution, even to watch a brutal form of bare knuckle boxing. Boxing is the oldest sport known to the world, dating back to the Minoan civilization in 1500 BC. It's believed that hand-to-hand -hand combat may go back as far as 3000 BC to both ancient Egypt and Samaria. But the violent competition is best known from the ancient Olympic Games, where it first appeared in 688 BC. The matches were originally a way to honor fallen warriors and required the use of thick leather straps around the palm of the hand. But by the time of Prohibition, bare-knuckle fighting had become a drunken slugfest, where the only rule was anything goes. And in Portland, there was one place where it all went down. Today, this apartment complex sits on top of what was the ultimate fight club, where only the strong survived. Few people know what used to happen down here, and it's off-limits to the public. But Loretta Turner, the building's manager, knows all of its old secrets. And she was giving me exclusive access into this world of blood, sweat, and probably not tears. This complex used to be the Kenton Hotel, built in 1905. It was created specifically for the cattle buyers who came from all across the country to purchase their cattle. But while they stayed in comfort in the rooms up above, the real action was down below. Wow, so, Jesus, place is a huge basement. It is, isn't it? That's amazing. So this is as it was in its original state. Pretty much, yes. Mm -hmm. In the early 1900s and throughout Prohibition, just eight feet beneath the ground floor was a classic speakeasy, accessible by secret doors. 
But as time passed and the Fight Club was shut down, this subterranean space was locked up and forgotten. What do you know went, went on down here? They had uh, bare knuckle fighting down here really? in the uh, 1900s, uh, 1920s. They'd come down here and they'd uh, they have their booze over here and uh, they had the boxing in the dirt area. Here. I see. Hundreds of men and women would cram down here and though this 6,000 square foot space was large, they'd all be crowded around the main event. Even in those days, fighters made their entrance a showcase. This is how they got down here on these stairs. Oh, these are the original stairs? These are the original stairs. They I would see. come down here from the uh, pub upstairs. Okay, but there's a ceiling there now, huh? Well, right. <laughs> yeah. But this was there the original There wasn't at one time. As a matter of fact, I think you can still see the, uh, the uh, where they had the door up there. I see. So this was quite a grand little entrance It was, uh-huh. So there's a lot of cheering, there's a lot of screaming, and down comes the big star boxers, right. huh? Although these fights could draw a crowd, they were held in secret and were illegal, and for good reason. The fights were often bloody and ruthless and could last for as many as 100 rounds or until one of the boxers was knocked out. But this savage sport wasn't just for the entertainment of the locals. It was also good for business. The cattle buyers were important to Portland's economy. and. Uh, they wanted to keep it out of sight of the law. They wanted to provide this entertainment for these guys because they were, they were important people. And with their rooms right above, it would be easy to come down for a fight or a drink. But there was one man who the cattle buyers and the locals all came to the Kenton to see. Mysterious Billy Smith was our, our primary boxer here. He was a mean guy. This one time he boxed himself out. Basically, he couldn't lift his arms anymore. Mm -hmm and uh, his opponent was still standing, so what he did, rumor has it, he jumped up and bit off the guy's ear. Oof. It's the event that may have earned mysterious Billy Smith the title of dirtiest fighter of all time. This ultimate fighter's reputation grew in the 1890s when he became the welterweight champion. He was fueled by raw rage, and his rise to the top was helped along by his brutal tactics of elbowing, thumbing, and gouging his opponents. By the time he came to Portland in the early 1900s, he was notorious. He fit right in with a town already overrun with Shanghaiers and opium dens that was teetering on the edge of prohibition and the bootlegging explosion. But the dirty fights weren't the half of it. Amazingly, this entire neighborhood may have been connected with underground tunnels. There were other speakeasies in the area, and locals speculate this bricked up passageway may have linked up to an entire underground den of vice. Speakeasies, brothels, gambling, all leading to this fight club. This is the um, entrance to the tunnels that uh, went across the street over there. Oh, really? There. So they had a lot to do with the operations here. Oh, yeah, here. definitely. Well, their clientele would come down through uh -huh. there, you know, avoid all the, the hassle oh, really and is the a... law and everything. And so it's a really secret world down here. Oh, yeah, here. very, very. How cool. Less than 100 years ago in Portland, Shanghaiers kidnapped men and women, opium dens hooked the poor, sewers polluted the rivers, and bootleggers were running all the alcohol they could muster. But today, Portland is working hard to clean up the image of its past. Over the last century, Portland has changed from America's vice city to America's city on a hill. The Shanghai tunnels, brothels, and speakeasies of its past are now sunk beneath an ultra-modern metropolis. That's an example for the rest of the country. But as the people of Portland move into the 21st century, they should never forget that their dark past is always there, buried just below their feet. <laughs>